Welcome back to Out Loud, the Selective Mutism podcast. I'm Chelsea, and today we have a special guest. Her name is Rachel Busman. She's a psychologist. So welcome, Rachel. Thank um, you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. I guess, could you give us a little background about um, how you kind of fell into this role and got sure. involved in selective mutism? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in child and adolescent um, mental health disorders. And I've particularly been interested in anxiety disorders for a long time. And so I came to the Child Mind Institute about nine years ago and joined their anxiety team and started working with Steve Kurtz, Mm -hmm. um, who I know you know well. And so I started working with him and then I eventually um, took over the selective mutism at the Child Mind Institute when he went off on his own and started Kurtz Psychology. So I ran the selective mutism program there and ran Brave Buddies for a long time. Um, and just really became really passionate about SM. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have been on the board of directors for the Selective Mutism Association for a good number of years and was president of that, um, president of the organization as well. Um, Now I'm not the president anymore, but I stay really Mm -hmm. active on on the board with you as well. Um, And I have just transitioned to a new role. So I'm at Cognitive Behavioral Consultants, which is still in New York State, which is in White Plains. And I Mm -hmm. am starting a new um, child and adolescent anxiety program there. And I'm starting a selective mutism program at that um, organization. And I'm excited that I hopefully the next six months or so will start a new intensive group um, called Voices Rising. So I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to to talk about selective mutism and and how we can help families. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, that's really exciting. All the new stuff. Yeah, I guess one of my first questions. I'm kind of just thinking about COVID. I know we talked about this yeah. before. Um, I know in the beginning it was really hard for families when mm-hmm. they were trying to adjust to school shutting down and having to wear a mask and kids doing virtual um, yeah. school, which was, that was all a big transition. And now we're kind of going back to how things were in yeah. the beginning. Um, so I guess there's less in-person practice or mm-hmm. now kids are starting to get back into that. So I guess what are your tips uh, for getting back into the practice of doing exposures? Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's a really good question. This has been such an incredibly strange year and a half, mm-hmm. right? And it's like you said at the beginning, I think a lot of families that I worked with were really struggling um, to figure out how to keep momentum going mm-hmm. or just just keep keep gains going when so many things were changing, right? So right. kids had so such so many fewer opportunities to be in school and in social situations. So families were sort of like, what do we do? How do we keep momentum going? And, yeah. and I think I and a lot of other sort of people in the field were like, first of all, be compassionate with yourself, be gentle. We were all in a really stressful situation. So first we have to kind of recalibrate to the mm-hmm. demands of the situation and also figure out where we can practice exposure. So we got kids used to talking on camera and Mm -hmm. video chats. And now I think as we sort of shift to, I think as we move to the summer and to the new school year thinking, okay, kids are going to be going back. I think that presents its own set of challenges because a lot of kids and not just kids with selective mutism for sure have gotten kind of comfortable being maybe in an, in at home, less in school or just in a different way. And again, it's time to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. So I think my first tip would be for caregivers to remember, this is another transition. So it takes everybody a little bit of time to recalibrate Mm -hmm. and to just be patient. Right. And I think the first thing to do is figure out one first step. And Mm -hmm. it might be everybody, every family has a different first step, but that may be going to Dunkin' Donuts again, you know, if that was something that people did a lot or having a play date with a familiar peer, Um, but just remembering that it's all sort of a recalibration. We can't just say, okay, well, yesterday we were home and tomorrow we're going to be fully in school. So everybody just adjusts. It it takes a practice to get back to that um, sort of living the exposure lifestyle as, as Steve Kurtz yeah. likes to say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
I know it's going to be a transition for everyone, including myself. I haven't been working in person and I've started going into the office and it's definitely like something new. It feels like you have to readjust. So I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I know I went into the office a couple, maybe a couple weeks ago and I used to commute to Manhattan five days a week and it was Mm -hmm. over an hour each way. And then I did it after a year of not doing it. And after one day I was exhausted. Yeah. (laughs) I was just tired. And so I think just remembering, you know, when you, when you practice something, you get better at it. Mm -hmm. You practice staying away from something, you get better at that too. And so just, re-entering whether it's entering a work uh, you know an office or a social situation is just going to take a little bit of practice and Mm -hmm. I think being patient um which is so hard to be patient but caregivers and kids and teenagers can just be patient with themselves and remember like you'll get those sea legs back Mm -hmm. but it takes a little bit of time sometimes and sometimes it's you need to take a side step or a step back before you take two or three steps forward. Right. Another question I had was like, how hard should parents be pushing for their kids to get back into practice? Like, I guess it can feel like a lot at once and you kind of want them to be back at the level they were at and some of them. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's, I think in some ways it might depend on the age of the child, Mm -hmm. but I think it's always helpful to frame it as, well, first of all, if kids went up to their parents and just said, you know, I really think it would be good for me to practice this really hard thing. They would be very remarkable humans, right? Mm -hmm. Most kids don't have that, you know, internal monologue at a young age that can think about consequences of the future, right? Mm -hmm. Most kids are sort of living in the here and now. So we shouldn't expect our seven-year-old to say, you know, I need more practice entering (laughs) social situations, right? So we want to remember that. I think parents or caregivers can remember that you're probably going to have to push a a little bit past where your child is comfortable, but we want to stay just slightly out of reach. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to go back first, start with something that your child probably can comfortably do, even if it means you're starting a little bit easier, Mm -hmm. better to accumulate some successes first. Like, yeah, high five. That was something we did before. And it's something we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And I also think the way we frame it is so important. So if a parent says something like, you know, hey, Chelsea, do you want to go order at Starbucks? A child could often be like, no, you do it. Mm -hmm. Versus do you think when we go to Starbucks and we order, do you want to order the drink, the food or both? Mm -hmm. That is now you're asking a question. So I think it's good to give kids choices, but we want to give kids or tweens or teens choices in the areas where we actually want to give them choice rather Mm -hmm. than, do you want to do this hard thing or you don't? Most people would say, "Mm, I'd rather not do that hard thing, but it's fine to me. If Chelsea, you said, I want to order the drink. Then I'd say, great, you order the drink. I'll order the food. But I think so setting it up sort of for success Similarly, like, you know, now that things are um, opening up again, we can actually have some play dates. Do you think you want to have so-and-so over or so, or, you know, Susie or Johnny Mm -hmm. versus do you want to have someone over or you rather just stay on your own? Because some kids would just say, no, you know, I'm I'm fine like this. (laughs) And so I think I often try to remind parents, of course, people opt into sort of the option that's easier or more comfortable. And so setting the, setting the options for things we, we would like to opt into. Um, And then I think the last thing I'd say is just, it's not harmful Mm -hmm. to set challenges for your kids. It's, it's, it's not a good idea to set challenges that are way too hard because no one feels good when they're set up for, Um, you know, an unsuccessful moment, but it's Mm -hmm. not dangerous to put your kids in situations where they're going to face challenges. So setting a challenge just slightly past where your child's comfortable is probably a good Mm -hmm. place. And then if it doesn't go as planned, you know, Chelsea, that did not go exactly as planned. That was harder than I thought. That was, I didn't expect that clerk to be so chatty. We'll try again. We'll try again tomorrow. 
because mm-hmm. I think that also models resilience right. and models like not everything goes as planned and that's fine. We'll get through it and we'll, we'll move on to the next challenge because every challenge is different. I love that. Um, I know you mentioned Dunkin' Donuts, but yeah. I'm wondering, are there any other um, exposure ideas for Yeah, I, I mean, I think to, yeah, to me, anything is an exposure, yeah. right? So I think, you know, places, I think caregivers um, also might have been out of practice. So mm-hmm. you want to choose a situation also as a caregiver where you, it's sort of a parallel process, like where you feel a little bit in your comfort zone. So I would say a busy party is probably not the best place to start, yeah. right? Because just a lot of variables, yeah. a lot of adults, a lot of kids, a lot of noise, a lot of unpredictable things. Whereas let's say a one-on-one play date, um, going to, let's say, Starbucks or a pizza place or Dunkin' Donuts, a mm-hmm. sort of time-limited ordering experience. Right. Um, I think um, a farmer's market, I, Target, Trader Joe's, um, I think, you know, places where you can, um, and, and I think those types of places can be good because no matter where your child is at, in terms of speaking, you could set a goal. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, let's say the highest level of support needed, maybe you go into Trader Joe's with your child and in your mind, your goal is I would like to ask my, my child a question in the store, not someone else, me, the adult, the the parent near someone else. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just like, okay, so like Chelsea, should we get, um, should we get those cool, like mini, you know, mint chocolate chip ice cream? bars or should we get the strawberry ones and maybe the goal is just that your child is answering your questions at a store where other people are versus maybe for another child it might be that you're at the checkout counter and you're one person away and you're asking questions where the the spotlight is a little more obvious so like the clerk or the checkout person is really just Mm -hmm. a few feet away or maybe you say right at the counter um you know, they just asked us if we want, if we brought our own bags, um, did we bring our own bags or we need bags? Mm-hmm. So maybe prompting your own child at, at the counter. And I also think we, a lot of us have talked about that um, strangers, like clerks, people at a store are often really willing to yeah. help. If you say, hey, miss, um, it, we're practicing answering questions. Can you ask my child if we brought our own bags or we need a bag? Most People I've found, and again, I was working in New York City yeah. for nine years where people are often, the perception <laughs> is maybe not as friendly, but I have mostly found that people are totally open to helping and would say, oh, sh- oh, sure, I'll ask your, I'll ask them. So I think you can set the goal mm-hmm. depending on where your child um, is at. So those would be like store type things. You could certainly have a play date at your own house. Um, at a public place or at someone else's house. And what I'll say about play dates is that even though it might feel a little awkward for the caregiver, having a teeny bit of structure to a play date can really help. Mm -hmm. If you just let the kids go play magnet tiles or play Legos, there might be talking, but it's hard for the caregiver to insert themselves. Whereas if you say, hey guys, before you go off and play in Sarah's room, I have this, I have a baking activity for us. Mm -hmm. Let's bake together. And maybe it's just 20 minutes, but then you're kind of able to ask questions to your child and Mm -hmm. another child. And usually caregivers feel a little bit more secure when they know what they should do. Yeah. I think that's a great idea for play dates too, just because like that activity before, I guess, more unstructured play Mm -hmm. serves as like a warm up period where- Yeah, sometimes it can take the prompting for a kid to start. Exactly. And and the thing we know is that let's say you do a baking activity or Mm -hmm. a game, you can prompt the the friend Mm -hmm. much as like just like you would prompt your own child, right? So if it's a seven or eight year old and you say, you know, Sarah, it was so nice for you to come over and hang out with me and Jackson. We were gonna bake. Um, have you ever made cupcakes before? You haven't. You can ask that type of question to another child, and that's yeah. completely <laughs> fine. Um, 
I think when, when you get to tweens and older kids, yeah. you have the challenge of just, um, you know, your child might not want you as involved, right? Yeah. They might want you to skedaddle. And uh-huh. I think having a plan in advance, a role play, um, an acti- again, an activity mm-hmm. that you and your child have sort of chosen, and then asking your child, do you want me to help you? Or do you think you want to do this on your own? especially when it's an age of a child where they might feel like it's very uncool Mm -hmm. for you to be involved. We wouldn't want to set kids up to feel uh, socially awkward. Right. My next question is kind of about going back to school, which we're not there yet, but I'm sure people are worried about it. Yeah. I would be worried about it. Like, I don't know. They've been, especially for people that have been doing the virtual like online learning yeah. all year, it would be kind of scary to go back in yeah. person. So any tips on helping people yeah. ease I, back I, in? Yeah, I think planning ahead is always really important. So I'm glad we're talking about this now, right? Mm-hmm. Because even though people are like, I mean, I don't know when this, when we're going to air, but it's June today, right? So yeah. Some people might be thinking, why are you talking about school? We haven't even gone to summer, right? <laughs> but planning ahead is our friend. Yeah. So meaning some schools will be able to tell a family pretty, pretty far in advance who the child's teacher will be. Mm-hmm. Sometimes schools will say, well, we're not going to know until much later in the summer. But regardless, I always tell families to plan ahead. And that might mean um, visiting the school Later in the summer before school opens, even if you don't have your teacher assignment yet, going back into the school building, making some visits. Most schools will let you walk into the building Mm -hmm. Um, COVID as COVID restrictions lift. I think that'll be easier. Um, I think when you do know who the teacher is, planning um, a fade in or planning to meet the teacher, not on the first day of school, Mm -hmm. not at a meet and greet with 20 other kids, um, but something before. Mm-hmm. And I think when families have a 504 or an IEP, which is f- for anyone who doesn't know, sort of like a special, either a special education plan or an accommodation plan for school. Often when I work with families and schools, we write a transition plan right into that document. Yeah. Um, so I do think planning ahead by visiting the building, visiting the building and talking in the actual physical building, meeting the teacher, I think being virtual has helped us realize that um, video calls are not hard. So having a video call to meet the teacher can be uh, also a really great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think planning ahead is usually um, is to our benefit. So it's, I don't think it's ever really too early to try to set the stage Mm -hmm. for success. So my, my tip, my number one tip would be, leave the current school year with some plans for when to reconnect in the end of the summer so that we're not starting on the first day of school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. And a lot of people haven't taken advantage of that or a lot of people don't think to do that. But when I was little in first grade, I was able to meet my teacher before um, the first day of school. And that was like such a big change. Yeah. And it just sets you up for success because we know like how these patterns can develop and getting ahead of it can really be helpful helpful to hear that, Chelsea. And I also think that sometimes schools might say, you know what, let's see how it goes. Let's Mm -hmm. start the school year and see. And I get that for lots of situations, that's an okay approach, right? I know you, you know, you work with your BCBA, so you work with certain presentations. My guess is where Maybe you would say, okay, let's, let's wait. But there are probably other situations where you'd say, mm, no, waiting's not such a great idea. Right. And I think with selective mutism, front loading, mm-hmm. uh, I, I would front, I heavily front load um, the, the sort of interventions, the accommodations. Mm-hmm. We really don't want to wait because we don't yeah. want kids to practice not talking. So even if you, I don't you know how, know how long you met the teacher for, but even just to, brief meeting where the teacher just says it's so nice to meet you I'm so excited for you to be in my class this is where your seat is going to be for kids who are anxious that really can help quite yeah it's one less thing to be worried about you already know (laughs) and sometimes you know it's it's a nice opportunity for the child to bond right Mm -hmm. so you know I've worked with 
lovely teachers who are like, this is very special. Nobody knows where all the seats are, but now you've seen your yeah. seat and it kind of feels special. Yeah. Um, I think for kids who have it in their IEP or 504 to actually have a formal fade in, mm-hmm. that can be so, um, so helpful, right? So where yeah. the child meets the teacher and either the parent or someone else at school transitions speech, um, mm-hmm. that can be a really... Um, can be a huge, a huge game changer for families. So I think it's never too early to sort of plan even a teeny bit in advance. Mm -hmm. Just to throw it out there too. We always tried to find out who, like who the other kids were in the class and like plan play dates because that makes a big difference too. Totally. I'm so glad you brought that up. We were talking about the teachers, but I think it's absolutely true, right? So for families where you can find out the class list Mm -hmm. Um, and some schools don't share the class list for like privacy reasons but usually there are workarounds right so when Mm -hmm. my son was in earlier grades they didn't share the class list but there was always a class rep who got the list super fast so you would be able to sign up let's say for a google document where you put your own child's name on there and then it's fine so I think being able to figure out some workarounds. Um, and also, even if you just find out a few kids' names, right. um, setting the stage again, having maybe a play date outside of the school setting um, can be really helpful. I mm-hmm. will say that sometimes parents might feel anxious. Maybe yeah. they have social anxiety. Maybe they just have a little bit of jitter. So it can feel awkward to reach yeah. out to someone and say, Hi, Chelsea, my daughter's in your daughter's class. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have a play date. So I agree or or I admit that it might be an exposure for a parent (laughs) to reach out. But I think it's actually really probably a good experience to just be brave, right? Most, (laughs) again, most other parents are going to be pretty nice, right? Occasionally you might have someone who says, no, we're really busy or no, that's not going to work out. But a lot of people, it's most people would say, Oh, that's so nice. You want to get together. You want to get our kids together. That sounds great. Um, and then I think if your child can go into the school year, even knowing one or two kids, that also is going to really set them up for some success. Yeah. We talked a little bit about this before, but I'm sure there's parents and kids who have kind of just been trying to survive during this pandemic and just like kind of haven't been doing any exposures and maybe they've just kind of been like sailing along Mm -hmm. (laughs) and now they're like, oh no, like they've regressed, like, or they're stuck at a certain point. Like, how can they get back on track? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And I always, whenever I hear the word regress, I mm-hmm. always like my ears go up because regress to me is like, whoa, that's, yeah. that sounds bad. <laughs> and so I'll usually try to have a ton of empathy and be like, I get it. Sometimes there are great days and there are less great days or this pandemic has like put everyone in sort of a place where they don't feel like they're doing everything they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. But again, rather than regress, let's think of it as recalibrate, right? Right. So for some caregivers or kids or both saying, look, yes, we're going to get back into living an exposure lifestyle, or we're going to get back to doing activities and sports and arts and all that, but we can't do everything. So let's Mm -hmm. start with one thing. And so Mm -hmm. if we were going to do one thing, would we focus on play dates? Would we focus on ordering? Would we focus on something else, right? But taking one step and saying like, I don't have to do all things today. Let me just pick one thing I think is really important because what sometimes happens is we get overwhelmed. I mean, I do this too. I have a list of 20 things to do. And then I look at that list and I think, oh, this is such a huge list. So I just am not going to do any of those things. Instead of saying, well, I have a list of 20 things. Let me pick one thing. And once I start to do that one thing, then I'll have 19 things left. And so similarly, Mm -hmm. if caregivers and kids can be like, we got to get back on the horse here. Let's just pick one area to start. Because it's just too overwhelming to think of every possible thing. 
And I think yeah. once we get started with one thing, then we accumulate some successes. That feels really good. We want to do more. Um, and so I think that's important to remind ourselves that mm-hmm. this has been a really stressful time. We have parents that are working from home or working and parenting from home. Or like my husband is now transitioning back to his office in the city. And that transition is also another change. So we have Mm -hmm. to be sort of gentle with ourselves, but also, like you said, knowing when to push a little bit. So it's time to do some of these things, get back out into the world, but I can't do it all today. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's important. I think the other thing I was going to say that I've, I've noticed a lot and I don't know um, if, if caregivers or people are feeling this is I've noticed because I've been working with some kids where I've had the opportunity to work with them virtually. Mm-hmm. And then I've had the opportunity to see them in person. I was going to ask really, about this. Yeah. It's been a really humble reminder that not just, just as a child is talking on in a virtual, like in their home virtually mm-hmm. doesn't mean that it's automatically going to translate. So I think that's helpful. And even I sort of forgot this after working with Mm -hmm. lots and lots of kids, right? So as an example, working with a child virtually where we were able to do a fade in, I've been Mm -hmm. coaching a parent, the kid is chatting up a storm with me on the camera. Yeah. And that's maybe not so surprising because kids are more comfortable at home. Yeah. And then I've had a couple of situations where um, I went to their home or they came to my home And they were initially more inhibited. Mm -hmm. It didn't just automatically like, oh, I saw you on camera and we've chatted a lot and I'm naturally going to just talk to you here. And and it wasn't because they didn't know who I was. I showed them what my face looked like with and without a mask. So it's a nice reminder that not all environments are created equal. So it's okay. The good news is, is that in a couple, and I've had a couple of these situations, the child warmed up. Mm -hmm. much faster than they would have had they never met me. So it was still a faster fade in, but I still needed to go back a few steps and give them warm up time. So I think that's helpful for parents, especially because I've had some parents saying, but I don't understand. Like they, he or she was talking a lot to their teacher when they did zoom calls, Mm -hmm. but then we went into school and they quote regressed. And I would say, "Well, well, they didn't regress. You went into a new environment. So we need to, again, recalibrate. And, and if, if now I have had other situations where the child um, did talk to me the same as they would on camera. And, Mm -hmm. and I take, I'm taking that as like, great. So that's good news. But if they didn't, it's not a big deal. We need to give them more warm up time. So Mm -hmm. I'd say like, Chelsea, it's so good to see you again. I love that I get to see you in person instead of on the cat, on the, computer and I'd still do what I do in my practice which is use those warm-up skills yeah. without any questions to just give the child time to be comfortable mm-hmm. instead of just kind of going in full force and so it was a nice reminder to me that if I needed to remind myself that probably parents yeah. could benefit from that and teachers too Yeah, I'm trying to think of like an equivalent to that from when I was younger, but we didn't have Zoom or anything. But I definitely feel like in person would be a full, like a whole different experience. Like there's less you can control. There might be more people around. That's right. Yeah. And it's just, it reminds us that sometimes um, what selective mutism and just anxiety in general can sometimes be a little inconsistent or Mm -hmm. idiosyncratic, right? So on one hand, um, you know, families will say like, I don't understand why all the kids are sitting in circle time and she's standing. She can't seem to sit down, but like, doesn't she realize it's more attention than she's standing? And my thought is sure, but like, she's kind of frozen. So she can't really move. So she's not thinking it would just be less obvious if I sat down, right? So similarly, just because we chatted on camera doesn't necessarily mean that when they see me in person, it's going to be just as fast. So I think it's helpful to remember, like, we just always want to start with the expectation of we're going to give warm up. We're going to kind of go in slowly. And then again, always kind of move 
to the next goal that's just slightly out of the child's reach. Mm-hmm. But um, it was humbling for me to remember, oh, yeah. I shouldn't get too greedy. I don't because we sometimes get greedy with our expectations. And it was this happened because with a couple of different kids where I said, Oh, Rachel, you need to be slower, mm-hmm. back off, give the child more time to warm up. And then I think like for teachers, especially yeah. sometimes teachers or other family members can take it personally. Like, Oh, yeah. maybe he doesn't like me. Maybe she doesn't like me. And I say, Oh, well, Miss Chelsea. Nope. She loves being in your class. She loves coming to your sessions. She just, she's just struggling with her words right now, but it has mm-hmm. nothing to do with liking you or not liking you. In fact, right. she talks about your class when she's home. We just, you know, SM is kind of a funny thing that we need to just sort of respect some of those um, rigidities or sort of sometimes yeah. rules around speaking. Right. Um, but I think letting teachers and caregivers know this is to be expected. I'm not worried. We'll get back there is, is helpful. Yeah. And it's good to hear that they kind of warmed up faster. They did. After seeing you virtually first. It was interesting. Yeah. So I think the store, the takeaway was the parents said, oh yeah, they did need to warm up Mm -hmm. again, but well, that was a lot faster than what I would have expected. So to me, the, the treatment generalized, it just wasn't, it wasn't just like, oh, just because I talked on Zoom, I automatically am just ready yeah. to go off to the races at, at the house. Yeah. Um, so it just reminds us similarly um, when we get back into school or we get into camp or music lessons or things like that, let's not make assumptions. We'll just have mm-hmm. to still ease in to, to things. Right. Yeah. I wonder, like, kids must feel frustrated, too. Like, oh, I used to be able to do this, and now I can't. Yeah, I think they probably do with kids that are a little bit older. Mm -hmm. I definitely, in my work, use a lot of, um, you know, analogies or or just metaphors around practicing anything. Mm -hmm. You could really pick, all of us have in our life, something we've practiced and gotten Mm -hmm. better at. And then something that when we stopped practicing, we didn't lose the skill, but it was not as strong. So whether it's skiing or swimming or, or, you know, running or playing an instrument, right? Let's say you play Mm -hmm. an instrument and you don't practice your scales for a bunch of months, they're going to be a little rusty. So I think kids do well also hearing this is tip. This is not anything to be super worried about. Like all people, when they practice, they get better at it. And when they don't practice, they don't have as much, you know, opportunity to sort of build those muscles. So I'm not worried. We'll, it will get back there, mm-hmm. but it's going to mean we might need to practice things that we didn't think we'd need to practice. Right. And this is where I think like there, there are a lot of parent groups out there for SM and even like mm-hmm. groups for individuals where I'm sure that if you, someone posted, I went to Starbucks today and it wasn't hard two years ago and now it was hard. I'm sure 50 people would say, I totally get that. Yeah. It was hard for me too the other day or some, something like that. So mm-hmm. hearing support from others can, can be encouraging. Yeah, definitely. I know even for not like, I do not have selective mutism <laughs> anymore. And like going, I'll use the ordering coffee. I haven't gone to a drive through for a long time and going for the first time in a while I was like I don't remember how to order a coffee like you stumble I mean, over your words a bit it, totally and it just even yeah all those things are just <laughs> a little awkward right yeah. or even going I you know recently went to a meeting and it's like okay I don't shake people's hands because like we don't shake hands right now and then like I <laughs> see someone do I hug them do I not hug them it's like all those social rules are a little yeah. awkward but remembering like everybody feels a little awkward. Um, and like you said, like you probably didn't think about ordering your coffee two years ago or a year and a half ago. And now it's like, okay, I've done this for a really mm-hmm. long time. So, right. I'm supposed to say this first and then, Oh, don't forget to ask for the Splenda. And, but, but once we do, I bet once people do it a bunch of times, then it's like, Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. You get right back into it. Right back into it. Exactly. Do you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Well, I think, I think the other thing I've mentioned 
is just as I'm thinking about sort of like getting back out into the world, Mm -hmm. a lot of families have told me um, that like old worries that seem to be a thing of the past might resurface. So for example, like separation worries, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe a child, and it doesn't have to be a young child, but I think, again, if we go back to practicing, if you've been home with a caregiver or you haven't been leaving the house on a regular basis, sometimes kids who either had separation anxiety or even just are a little more anxious or anxiety prone can sort of see resurgence of like old worries. And I would both say that's not unusual, but then you really want to figure out how can we nip this now? And I think the answer is exposures, right? So for kids who are like, if we go on one end of the extreme, some kids who just like are following their parent around and really don't want to separate even in the house, we want to do things like go upstairs and get your pajamas and come back downstairs. Like those are great places to start. Yeah. And then I think for kids that are like not at that extreme, but are hesitant to, let's say, sleep in their own room or let a parent go run an errand, it is easier in the moment to just say, well, never mind, just just sleep yeah. in here or just come with me. But I think those are the types of things that tend to snowball without practice. Mm-hmm. So I think now is a really good time to tackle those other worries. And sometimes it's separation, sometimes it's like little aches and pains, Um, So helping kids to be like, our bodies send us messages sometimes for danger. And they also send us false messages sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I just think that, you know, I know we're talking about speaking, but with, because SM is an anxiety disorder, sometimes we have other anxieties. So we want to just be on the lookout for those and look for how we can um, sort of, again, just do exposures. Um, So yeah, yeah, I think, I think now maybe is the, we could have the summer, the summer of bravery, right? For all mm-hmm. of us, just the summer of, you know, getting a little bit out of our comfort zone, you know, trying new things and just kind of getting back into the, the saddle of practice. Yeah, I think that's all amazing advice. Thank <laughs> so thank you so much. Sure. I guess I'd also say as we're sort of wrapping up that mm-hmm. um, since we both are on the board of directors for SMA, I think we can safely say that we we like our content, right? So we have a pretty, I think in the last year, we've really developed a pretty nice YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, and so I like to send people to the YouTube channel for Selective Mutism Association, because mm-hmm. there are a lot of really good webinars that I think for caregivers who are feeling like they want to brush up on skills or they want to hear about a particular topic. Yeah. It can be nice to, they're free, you can view them, you can share them, and that can be a nice place for um for caregivers to get some resources. Yeah. I like, I have shared it before, but I'll share it again. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I put the link. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, our, with our conference coming up in October, I hope that people will join us virtually, right? We mm-hmm. were sad that we're not going to be in person this year, but I think to be honest, there's over always a silver lining, right? So the yeah. silver lining is that if we're having a virtual conference in October, you don't have to, get on a plane to travel mm-hmm. there. So it allows people to enjoy the conference from their own home and maybe in their pajamas or yeah. you know, comfortable on the couch. And I think maybe more people can come because they won't have to pay for the travel. I and all that. totally agree. I mean, again, I think like one of the reasons, one of the things we love about the conference is the networking and really yeah. me- meeting people and talking. But on the other hand, um, we can, you can have actually a pretty um, interactive experience, even on Zoom with a chat yeah. and with Q&A. And so I agree with you that maybe, especially we've had some, inter- like I've done some trainings recently and we have some international people that come or mm-hmm. people from really far away. And is like you said, you don't, you're paying maybe for the entrance to the conference, but no travel, no hotel, no Mm -hmm. extra, you know, food and lodging kind of thing. It it allows us to reach more people and connect with more people. So I'm excited about that in October. Yeah. And I've been to a lot of the virtual conferences and they're still like interactive and people are amazing at answering questions. So I definitely encourage people. I I think if you asked me a couple years ago, I would probably Mm -hmm. say, oh, I don't think I'd want to attend a virtual conference. That (laughs) That sounds boring or that sounds... Like I'm not going to be able to 
um, like really learn or really yeah. experience it. But I, I do think that there's um, the ability to chat and connect and get like real time resources right in the chat. So yeah. I think, again, like there's always a silver lining. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> I was really excited to be here. Thank you.